<clears throat> well, good morning, folks. Uh, welcome to the Rangers Reviews Morning Briefing um, after a quite terrible uh, afternoon and evening at Hamden. I mean, I was there, you were watching on. It's, it's not the result we want to be talking about. And I, I think in the manner of the defeat, everything, the comments after it, it was, as, it was as bad a day as it could have been when I think pre-match there was a lot of optimism that it could uh, start the new era off well, wasn't it? Yeah, there should have been optimism. Uh, Giovanni Van Bronckhorst was uh, sitting in the stands, which we might get onto this, um, Joshua. I hope that you've got this on your um, list of talking points because I think that was absolutely right. Uh, there's a lot of there's been a lot of comment this morning um, about whether or not Giovanni Van Bronckhorst should have been down into the dressing room and tearing into them. Absolutely ludicrous. You've got a man who's been appointed and he's just got his work permit through, hasn't been watching any of the training, doesn't know any of the players individually, and you're expecting him to go down and manage a game. I mean, I, I just can't get my head around that. It's, it's your da thinking, it really is. It's 1980s stuff. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't even believe that I was reading some of that stuff this morning, honestly. Uh, bizarre. Uh, it doesn't even cut it. Of course Giovanni Van Bronckhorst wasn't going to take over this game. That, that's utterly ludicrous. Uh-huh. Um, but regardless, Rangers players shouldn't have needed the motivation from a manager yesterday. It's, it, you know, I've seen a lot about the substitutions um, in the game, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all irrelevant. It really is it's irrelevant. Rangers are better players than Hibs. They've got a dreadful cup record. And the players should have been motivated enough themselves to go out and attack that game properly. They, they, they were unprofessional in their, the way they went about that game last night. You can't persuade me any anything else. Um, fundamentally, we're talking about basics here. We're talking about tracking runners. We're talking about making uh, making runs. Uh, if you look at Alfredo Morelos swanning about up front, and not for the first time, not for the first time. I've been talking about it on this video all season that Alfredo Morelos does not work hard enough for his teammates. It's not been addressed by the previous management incorrectly. As I say, this is not me speaking after the fact. I've been talking about it consistently on this video all season. He is lazy and he is not the player that we all know he can be. And no one's a bigger fan of Morelos than me. But ultimately, he needs to be dropped. It's as simple as that with performances like that where he just doesn't make runs for his, his teammates. There's, there's, there's absolutely no defence. Um, but listen, I'm getting... I'm going scattergun here. Back, there's to, a lot. back to your point. There was no reason why Rangers couldn't go out and actually make that work yesterday. No reason whatsoever. It was all there for them. And they went and lost the plot in that 15-minute spell. Credit to Hibs, right? That's the one thing I would say. Credit to Hibs. They got the tactics absolutely spot on. You can talk about this, Josh, in more detail than I can. But they clearly learned from Slavia, Prague and Malmo. Rangers don't cope well with the 3 5 2. It's as simple as that. The wing backs get in behind the full backs and the two strikers right on top of um, the, the two central defenders. They couldn't cope. Yeah. Um, but they should have been able to. They should have because they've got better players than Hibs. And uh, it just wasn't anywhere near the standard that's expected of the club. And I suppose yeah. the, the one silver lining is that you've got Giovanni Van Bronckhorst now coming in today and is able to reset this team because that is what they need right now. They need mm-hmm. reset. No one was that surprised, I don't think, by it, by the performance. Maybe the result, but the performance, yeah. it's not surprising based on the season we've, we've watched so far. Yeah, yeah, and it was the culmination really of, um, you know, the team have, have perhaps at points gone off lightly um, and, and perhaps got results that... Their their performances didn't merit, and they were punished for, for what was a terrible start. And it was it was it was um it was like watching a ghost of a team. You know, the last time obviously that this uh this side played at Hamden was uh, the, the cup final, which obviously they lost in twenty nineteen, but dominated. Morelos compared to that day was just a completely different player. Hibbs, as you say, uh, the, their wing backs got high, which meant that and, and Tavernier and Barisic couldn't get high because of the threat of the two on two up top. Which you know, <coughs> Bolton and Balogun were not winning those battles yesterday. The difference between Kevin Nisbet and Alfred Morelos, but also the difference between how Porteous and and Hanlon defended comparatively was, was again just night and day. And it was it was when it goes three 0 you're looking around in shock, but also thinking before Arfield scores that goal, 
Hibs could have went and got fourth. Such was the kind of um, disdain on the pitch, and uh, it, it, it was quite remarkable to to see. And, and um, yeah, I, I think the comments after the game make the manager coming in his job more difficult. He doesn't. He didn't need that. He didn't need Conor Goldson to go and say that on TV last night. Um, the substitution. <laughs> That's an understatement. Yeah, well, and and then you look at the substitutions. It's not on the, the interim coaching staff, but and um, to have Jack Kamara and Davis on there chasing the game, it's crazy. You got Bakun on the bench, who's a goal threat from central midfield. But I think you're right, Johnny. They could have done any. They could have done anything, and uh, the approach wasn't there. You look at even Ryan Kent walking off the pitch. Rangers are about to go out of a, a major cup semi final, and he's literally walking off the pitch instead of running. So there was so much wrong with it. Um, and it really did look like the team, a team at the end of their cycle, and and that needs um, someone else to come in. I thought the concession of all three goals, and we can we can speak about them briefly now, were um, just systemic of the season. You've got the first one, which I don't know what Tavernier is trying to do. It's almost similar to the the concession of the Hearts goal, where he he's at the back post and, and doesn't do his job, but Balogun loses the initial contact. Rangers concede the first goal. You got the second goal where. Um, the, the central defender is turned, Balogun by Nisbet, diagonal run across, um, takes Goldson out, out, out of the play, far too easy to play uh, down the side of Rangers and through them, a complete carbon copy of what we've seen in the Europa League, as you say. Um, and the third goal, again, is basic mistakes. Um, and, and Stephen Davis makes the error, but he's atoning for for other errors. So I thought Stephen Davis was the only player that got pass marks uh, for me yesterday. I thought actually, oh, I, I, I'll disagree with you to the hill with this. This one, I think, if you look at how he, I mean, he was playing with ten players there yesterday, apart from maybe Arfield. But I thought Aribo was the only one. decent player on the pitch. I've got to say, I, yeah, I thought he, I thought he started well, but I thought, um, I thought, da- I thought Davis was was better as the game wore on because you right. look at what he was doing. He was, but he was, he had so much to do defensively, and it's kind of the quiet things in terms of trying to stick close to central defenders because they were two on two, but then also in terms of kind of retaining pressure. Um, it was it wasn't vintage, but um, certainly from from my vantage point, I thought he was he was the player who kind of he, he looked like he was he was playing and he wasn't phased by the occasion. And, and whereas every other player looked maybe a rebo side, a little bit of a shell, and an Arfield who obviously scored the goal. Um, but yeah, on those goals, Johnny, as you say, it's it's been coming. And, and I wrote in my piece this morning that Hibbs could have scripted to a T how Rangers were going to play. Rangers didn't really have a tactician to change it from the side as they have against a St Mirren or an Aberdeen. And um, that means that Hibbs know effectively exactly what Rangers are going to do and can fine-tune their, their script of the game to suit that, can't they? Yeah, um, listen, I think in terms of co- coming away from this, I, I think Giovanni Van Bronckhorst needs to come in and kind of draw a line under some of these guys um, in terms of their, their form so far this season. I think first and foremost, Nathan Patterson needs to come back into this team and yeah. give it some energy and and, and vitality. Uh, and if that means switching to a three four three and pushing Tav to right centre back, then I'm all for that. I've been saying that for quite some time. Um, but I think it'll probably be a four three three, given what we know about Giovanni Van Bronckhorst. And if that means Tav's dropping out the team, then so be it. I think Connor Goldson would be another one. I think you would want to look at. Um, however, the problem is Leon Balligan's playing far too much football. We know from what Stephen Gerrard's told us a few times in the past that Leon Balligan's not really physiologically suited to playing two games in a week. You know, at his age and at his injury profile, he should really only be playing once or twice as he was uh, once as he was last season. Um, so he's played a lot of football, and I don't. I think he looks a bit now weary, like he, is, he has played too much football. Yeah, but what can you do? You've let Nico Katic go on loan. Um, you've got a guy there, uh, Simpson, who I think we all agree hasn't shown really what he's capable of, um, if he is capable of being a Rangers player. And I think that's still a major question mark. Um, and Phil Hillander's obviously got a, an injury and is going to be out for another uh, four or five weeks. So I would advocate dropping Goldson normally, but I really don't know who you would bring in and pl- replace him with. Um, I think Alfredo Morelos has got to be put into cold storage. And I think it needs to be a sharp shock for Alfredo Morelos. It's not put on the bench and brought in and then two games later he's back. He needs to be dropped. And I mean bombed out. Because what we're seeing with Alfredo Morelos is a total lack of application. 
I don't mind a lack of quality when a player's trying, but with Morelos, for me, I'm afraid, and again, I've been saying it all season, it's a total lack of application. And and that is not acceptable at Rangers. The minimum requirement is that you see a player given his all. And I think it's patently obvious with Alfredo Morelos that he's just not there. He's not at it for whatever reason. He needs to start showing what he's capable of. And I, I, and I caveat it all the time. I say, with these criticisms of Morelos, I think he's a phenomenal player. He's a fantastic player. But you cannot, you cannot go into a Rangers semi-final with an attitude where you're not going to run about and chase every ball. That's a prerequisite. Um, you know, this is not a club uh, where you can get away with that. It's just not. And 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 that needs to be looked at. Um, I think Ryan Jack, obviously, coming in, if there is uh, positives, high points in the game, I think his return, slow though it has been, unfortunately, because of the serious nature of his injury, is going to be a major plus point to that team. And if you can get Ryan Jack back with Glenn Kamara in the base of a two-man midfield with a number 10 in front of them, I think you've got something potentially very, very good there. And Rangers have got the, the quality to, to make sure that they have a dominant midfield. But, you know, miles away yesterday. And, and where they lost it was obviously uh, in the defensive areas and the fact they offered very, very little threat going forward. I mean, did uh, Big Macy and the Hibs goal have a save to make? No. No, not really. And again, it was a predictability of um, you look at where Kent was picking the ball up, um, there was a distinctive lack of width um, because Tavernier and Barisic couldn't go really high in the build-up. And then I think there was one overlap really in the first half uh, in which Hibs were stretched. But obviously in, in lacking width, it condensed, uh, made Hibs' jobs easier. It condensed the space that Rangers could, could play in. And, and again, that's just it makes it easier for Hibs to defend. Um, Rangers really looked like be, they looked beaten, and we'll come on to Goldson's comments. But mm. you were looking at that game at three one, and, and the Rangers only scored because of a mistake. They, did, they didn't carve Hibs open. They didn't, um, you know, move them from side to side and find a way through. They scored because Ryan Porches uh, made a mistake, and Scott Arfield scored with his left foot. Uh, but you know, they they they, uh, they they just didn't look like they were going to get back into the game. But it was two months ago, Johnny, that Rangers scored two goals in the second half against Hibs, albeit with ten men. But it's a similar. You know, game state in terms of having all the ball camped around the box. Um, so that was, I think, that was the most frustrating thing as well for for supporters that um, there was a just a, a lack of looked like a lack of belief. I think Morelos er, early in the game, you thought, okay, he's playing a little bit higher up. You obviously seen him run off the shoulder of Paul Hanlon once, um, but that aside, I thought he lost all the physical battles. Um, maybe received the ball well on one or two occasions, but it was really it was just an absent performance. Um, you know, you'd expect in that situation for him to kind of fight, fight for every ball when he's not getting much of it. But um, it was just a complete lack of that. I thought maybe bringing Sakala on earlier through the middle would have offered a different threat and just made it uncomfortable for Paul Hanlon in particular. Um, that didn't happen. We'll, we'll go on to substitutions before we go into Goldson's comments. Taking Kent off um, when you're not bringing Scott Wright on, moving Sakala to the left. Uh, bringing Hadji on, taking a rebo off our field off. It was, again, you, I don't think you can blame the coaching staff because they've been thrust into this. Yeah. Um, and it, 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 there looked to be a lot of confusion on the bench, but um, it, it, it wasn't a good look. And, and obviously then to go Davis, Jack and Kamara, I think the last time they were on the pitch together, or the last time they started against together was Benfica 3, Rangers 3. Um, this was obviously the midfield that Stephen Jarrett decided was too defensive uh, to, to play in the Scottish Premiership. I couldn't believe it, and I thought Ryan Jack's pass, Ryan Jack's passing, sped the game up to a degree because you remember, you remember uh, the one-one draw against Hamilton when uh, Ryan Jack and Stephen Davis come on off the bench, and you can, yeah. you can move the ball through quicker from that area of the pitch, and obviously it's you know causing reaction and, and improvement there will maybe improve things higher up the park. But I just I couldn't believe it. I couldn't understand the thinking whatsoever to go more defensive and more aggressive when again you need two goals. It was it was um, couldn't believe it watching on from the sideline. Yeah, it was, it was remarkable, and the substitutions were totally head-scratching. Um, I know uh, David McCallum, though, is highly rated, as is uh, Brian Gilmore, who I've, I've, I've met and talked to, and is a very articulate and intelligent football man. And I suspect there may be other factors that we're not aware of, because there's no way that they make those decisions, you know, 
uh, unless there are, there are. There's maybe injuries we don't know about or knocks or whatever, but it wasn't a good look and, and, it, and it, it did seem a bit of a head scratcher watching it on from, from the game. Uh, sorry, from the telly. Um, in, in terms of uh, Goldson's comments, Joshua, I mean, how did you come across them? Did you, you wouldn't have been actually seeing them at the game. Uh, you no, I've seen, 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 you, seen you tweeted it out and, uh, and I, yeah. I ghastly thought, surely not. But then uh, knowing, knowing your um, professionalism and etiquette, I thought he's not going to have, He's not going to have misheard. I've got I to be honest. I was a little bit concerned that I might have misheard because um, the reaction obviously blew up so fast. I thought I would have yeah. thought everybody would have been listening to this, but uh, I couldn't believe yeah. it. I mean, just I, I, I actually think as well, Johnny. You know, the, the hunger comment and and it kind of gives a bit of color to what you've seen this season, and and maybe it's something that you, you could argue that more than the the kind of the game's done at three one. Yeah. Because if Rangers vice captain is in a semi final sitting in the dressing room thinking the game's done, like, you will not find I don't think you'll find one supporter that thinks that's nearly acceptable. And, and I think that's that for me, that played out in the second half. The team didn't look like they hardly had a big chance until Gone and Goldson put one over the bar on eighty seven minutes. Yeah, but that was a crucial moment, you know. If that if that goes in, you know, you've it, it's the Alamo for the last you know, five, six minutes and, and, yeah. and Rangers have a real chance. But that kind of summed up Conor Goldson's day, didn't it? From the, the match itself to the yeah. post-match. It, it's just not acceptable, these kind of comments. A lot of people I've seen saying, well, it's it's honesty and we should be uh, thankful for the honesty. But I think these things just realistically are better kept inside the dressing room. There's a reason people kind of keep the keep the powder on these kind of comments. And I mean, Goldson said it himself. And as a journalist, I just knew the second he said, and I shouldn't say this, but you're like, here we go. Here it comes. Yeah. Uh, he knew, he knows himself. He shouldn't say it. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I suppose it's, it's a, it's a great insight into that dressing room and how they're, how they're thinking that he would say it. And I think gives you an idea of how much work Giovanni Van Bronckhorst actually does have yeah. Um, to make sure that this team is going to be fighting on the remaining two, well, three fronts because of Europe as well, for the rest of the season. I think he's got a bigger job on his hands than perhaps he really did realise. Steven Gerrard maybe thinking he got out of this team at the right time, uh, given some of the things that we saw yesterday. Because as you said earlier, it had a sort of end of days feeling about it. And I saw... Um, David Edgar Hart and Hand was tweeting that it was essentially um, it was a sort of sack and offence type game. It was that bad, and, and and listen, I totally I totally agree with that. It was it was a bizarre match to watch because, I mean, in a way, I kind of agree with Connor Goldston. Just kind of like you know the the narrative structure of the game, as it were. You you didn't really feel Rangers were going to come back. Maybe that was just me, but just watching the game pan out. The lack of chance creation, the fact that this Rangers team this season isn't scoring many goals, Alfredo Morello showing such little effort in the in the top half of the pitch, I just couldn't really see it. Even at three one, Joshua, you're you, you're watching it and you're thinking, well, if another goal goes in, then it's going to be a siege. But is it hope ahead of expectation? Well, again, like that again, come out at half time really set the intensity for 20 minutes. Maybe there's a little change that needs to take place tactically in terms of, as I say, retaining width a little bit more. Sakala coming on. There was even a couple of moments where Sakala at the back post, there was one header that he put across goal, um, which he, he got up for really well. And then a, a kind of scuffed shot that both felt the back post that an opportune striker in that moment could have maybe gambled and capitalised on. Mm. Um, Hib, Hib's a... Uh, you, you, you know, again, and the goal came from a mistake when, you, when you're loading Hibs' box. Rangers scored two goals in the second half against Hibs recently, whether it just be Hamden, whether it be... But then again, you come on to the conversation about hunger. How, how, how can those players not want to go and be desperate to go and firstly prove themselves, but also win silverware at Hamden for the supporters who, you know, have, have been... Uh, well, haven't had... I think the last major trophy at Rangers won at Hamden was in 2011. Um, that's a long time, and you know, again, as I said in my piece this morning, there was the cup exits have been, you know, you look at St Johnston and St Mirren, and they were freakish in elements of their nature, deserved and you know, and and, and damning in their own right. 
Um, the, the defeat to Celtic in the final was just, you, you, you couldn't have played better. Even the defeat to Aberdeen in Gerrard's first season, we have Sadiq misses that chance and, you know, just a bit of a, a crazy game. Yesterday was just terrible. Like, and it completely well, Hibs were good for their win. I think that's that's yeah, fair exactly. Hibs deserved the, the win. And Tactically, say, the outthought. Yeah, Rangers. you can say they had three shots, but Hibs, Hibs scored three goals by 38 minutes. That, that, that doesn't reflect how the game went. Hibs yeah. um, really at, at points, Hibs cut through Rangers so easily. Rangers didn't cut through Hibs once, um, and, and that was the difference. So it makes Gio Van Bronco, Giovanni Van Bronco's job harder in the sense that you know he's been unveiled as the Rangers manager and, and now the narrative is very very different um, than if Rangers had even scraped through that game if, even if Rangers hadn't played well and you'd seen a continuation of this season in terms of performance level there would have still been a, a far easier narrative to, to contend with but um, yeah as you say it's, it's an absolutely huge job and and then it's a, an absolutely huge game on, on Thursday for the club who could get through to the, the knockout stages of the Europa League. Um, but that's just three days away and that's not a lot of time, Johnny, for, for Van Bronckhorst to come and change stuff, is it? What, what's your take on whether or not Van Bronckhorst should have been in charge for this game? No. no how, if the players who have not won trophies in the last three seasons cannot motivate themselves... Yeah, I, I agree that there could have been, you know, tactical... Um, a little bit more tactical input would have helped that game, but that second half wasn't lost tactically. It was the tempo wasn't there, the, the desire evidently wasn't there based on goals in the comments. It's not on Van Bronckhorst. Um, if Van Bronckhorst had come in yesterday and they'd lost the game, the argument would have been really didn't allow. He disrupted it, and he he, he uh, as you said at the start, he doesn't know the players yet. What's he going to be able to do? He's not played Hibs three times in the last three years. Yes, he could, I'm sure, do a crash course in a day in terms of how they're going to play tactically. But it's so and it's so routine for for a new manager to come and sit in the stands first. Um, yeah. I just think Kashina did it. Um, obviously, that, that, yeah. that, that tenure did not work out. But he did it, and Rangers drew one one at Parkhead, and nobody said anything. Yeah, so it's, it's classic the, like, the after month. eventism. Yeah, oh, 100 percent. And you look at the last month as well, and um, as we've we've put out a few times the trend lines which show a, an upwards curve in the XG and a downwards curve in the XG you conceded. Um, the squad looking healthier before this international break. The optimism, as as we've covered, being really high at, at the national stadium from a, from a Rangers perspective beforehand. It was all set up. The players trying to impress a new manager. It, it was all set up to uh, for them to go and, and put in a good performance, but they didn't. I think that's completely on the players. Players, you know, are are often protected by the managers, but I think yesterday was just completely on the on the players and then. Yeah, the more uh, you know, another another failure in the domestic cup competitions, which is just absolutely absolutely damning. And um, it, as I say, it makes Thursday just a huge game, doesn't it? Um, and a, and a really difficult one for Gio. But um, I, I've got to be honest uh, on that, Joshua. Given the circumstances, I actually think Thursday's a big game. But you know what, the Europa League now, it's not really where it's at. Um, let's be honest about this season. The Europa League is almost completely irrelevant. Um, Rangers will get into the uh, the next stage of Europe, like Celtic. They'll go through to the Conference League. We know that based on where they're at. But the number one focus, the only focus, a bit like last season, actually now is on retaining this title and getting to the Champions League. That's the only thing that matters. And that is basically where Giovanni Van Bronckers has to channel all his energy. Um, this would have been a huge match for Steven Gerrard, but Giovanni Van Bronckers is coming into a slightly different situation. Yeah. And ultimately now it's a, it's about a, a kind of rescue job, which is bizarre to say for a team who are sitting four points clear at the top of the league. But it's pretty clear that this is a team that just needs, and I think um, Stevie Clifford summed it up in his piece today, uh, a Dutch brown brogue up the backside. It's a good line. It needs to be reinvigorated. It needs to be electrified. It needs to be brought back to life with the same vigour 
an electricity that marked last season. If Rangers don't find that, the problem is you've got a rival across the city um, who are looking resurgent, certainly as an attacking force. With a manager, I think, all bias aside, people would agree looks like he's got something about him. So the challenge is there. It's not like last season where there wasn't challenge. So it has to be that Giovanni Van Bronckhorst goes out and finds that electricity, that spark, whatever you want to call it, and injects it into his team. Because without it, it could be a very, very difficult season for Rangers. Yeah. And and that is not the kind of season you want to have in the most important season since the last one. But since the most the important one. season, taking away last season yeah. for a very, very long time, given the prize it's on offer, which is a club-changing amount of money in the Champions League. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely great. Okay, right, we'll, we'll leave it there, Johnny. Um, we'll be back, obviously, tomorrow morning, folks. Um, until then, remember to subscribe if you're watching on YouTube and uh, hit the notification bell so you will um, uh, get a notification when we go live. Remember as well to check out um, our website, rangersreview.co.uk, as Johnny mentioned, Stevie Clifford's piece on um, speaking about a Dutch brown brogue and more uh, on the site, looking at yesterday, two ninety nine a month for top quality journalism. We'll be back tomorrow morning um, looking back on uh, Giovanni Van Bronckhorst's unveiling, which we will be at later today and looking ahead to Thursday. Until then, enjoy the rest of your Monday and we will speak to you then. Cheers. <laughs>